Okay, we are at six o'clock. I think we will get started. We have a packed hour for everybody today. So good evening, everyone. My name is Constance McBaron. I am the Communications and Engagement Lead for EarthLab. EarthLab is an institute at the University of Washington that brings together communities, businesses, NGOs, public agencies, tribal nations, academia, and others to co-produce actionable research that generates solutions to our most pressing environmental challenges. I'm so pleased to welcome you to the second installment of the EarthLab Environmental Justice Salon series that attempts to answer the question, what does it mean to center equity and justice in environmental work? This series was co-developed by our former EarthLab colleague and social scientist, Sarah Jo Breslow, and our co-sponsors, Isabel Carrera Zamanillo from the College of the Environment, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion team, and Gina Aftab from the Center for Communication, Difference, and Equity. I would also like to thank my colleague, Lindsay Heaney, for your help planning this event. So before we do formal introductions, I have a few housekeeping items. So we are recording this event and it will be made available to you as soon as possible. And I would also like to point everyone to the bottom of your screen. There you will find the Q&A and chat functions. Our speakers, Owen and Raquel, invite you to ask questions here in the Q&A throughout the presentation, and they will answer them toward the end of the presentation. We'll also use the chat function for an interactive activity. Now I'll hand over the microphone to our co-sponsor, Isabel, from the College of the Environment to introduce herself and our speakers. Isabel? Thank you very much, Constance, and uh, thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon. Again, my name is Isabel Carrera Samanillo. I work for the College of the Environment in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion under the amazing uh, leading of Dr. Terrell Ross. And I want to uh, introduce today two wonderful speakers. Uh, first, I'm, I'm going to introduce Raquel West. She's a recent graduate uh, of the University of Washington with a double major in geography and history with a minor in American Indian studies. She studies representation, the speciality of those representations, and museum's dissemination of knowledge. She conducted her, her honors history uh, thesis at the Suquamish Museum, specifically looking at how the museum's platform influences their reservation. She continues to volunteer there and is also working at the Bill Holmes Center with the Burke Museum. In addition to being awarded as a Dean's Medalist and a Husky 100 for 2020, Raquel was the Editor-in-Chief of Plenum, the Undergrad Geography Journal, and two-time recipient of the Chester William Fritz Scholarship. Owen Oliver is a member of the Cunault Indian Nation and has heritage to the Pueblo of Isleta. Owen is a senior at the University of Washington, focuses on indigenous education through cultural revitalization within the Pacific Northwest indigenous communities. Owen was formerly a student in the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences in the College of the Environment. However, now he's taking that work into the American Indian Studies and Political Science Department. As a 2020 champion for change for the Center for Native American Youth and Unity 25 under 25, Owen stresses the importance of educating youth in and outside the classroom with the notion of living in space. Currently, Owen is creating the first indigenous walking tour at UW, a project funded by the Husky City Initiative and the Center for American Indian and Indigenous Studies. You can find more information on his website at owenloliver.com. Over to you, Owen and Raquel. Hey guys, thank you so much for being here. We got, we got a lot of participation and we have a wonderful um, presentation going on tonight. Um, we originally planned this for out of COVID times. I think we had a date around May um, and we kept pushing it back. Um, I said not to do it over virtual space, but at last we are here um, and we're gonna talk about representation in the museum. Um, we both have worked in a museum and look at it kind of differently. Um, so, yeah, anything else you wanna? No, nope, I'm ready. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, great. 
let's not get any spoilers in here. Don't look at the, there we go. <laughs> awesome. awesome. So how we present native knowledge is environmental justice. A case for indigenous storytelling. Now I want to open this up with, you know, a signature land acknowledgement and everybody, you guys know that kind of stuff. But due to the nature of COVID-19 and the ongoing pandemic, I'm currently living in Ketchikan, Alaska. Over Zoom and through various internet servers, I'd like to acknowledge the contemporary and ancestral lands of the Tlingit people, whose waters are shared with the Tsimshian and Haida people. It's our duties as students, educators, and researchers to honor and respect their traditions and ceremonies that continue to feed families since time immemorial to the songs that ensure reciprocity in their everyday lives. And we'd also like to acknowledge the land that the university sits on. So I'd like to acknowledge not only the lands and waters that the University of Washington resides upon, but also the caretakers of these lands and waters, the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot, who have been learning, teaching, and gathering knowledge here since time immemorial and will continue to do so well after the university is gone. And it's important to know that land acknowledgements are just a tool in your toolkit. It's not the first thing, it's not the last thing you should do. So remember to educate yourself and ask yourself what you can do next. Um, so yeah, let's take it off with um, why a case study with museums. So museums are staples in communities. They're found all across um, the colonial nation state in America. You can find them in Seattle, everywhere. And um, part of museum significance is their social power. And the fact that as a colonial society, they have a very strong presence as being knowledge holders and a place where you're supposed to learn. And so museums have a pretty unique way of facilitating this learning experience in that everyone is expected to learn something in a museum, even if you're an adult, when you're a kid, everyone goes to museums with the understanding that they will be learning something. And it's okay and, and part of the process to learn in these spaces. Um, I grew up in the Seattle school district and some of my fondest like elementary school and middle school memories were going on field trips to museums in the area. And so they have a really lasting impact, not only when you're a kid, but then when you um, go as an adult. And they're a big part of how we understand and learn and throughout our whole lives. And a big part of this and a part of how they derive power is that there's a certain amount of authority that comes with the museum. I remember first realizing about this social power when I noticed that I wasn't taught to critique museums. That being said, I would say that museums have done harm, which is part of why we're gonna be talking about museums today and communities who have been harmed by museums know that museums have not always been truthful and know that they have conducted harm through their power. But I think it's important to note that the colonial society doesn't want you to question, doesn't want the colonial society to question the authority of museums. So you're supposed to go in, you're supposed to have a good time, you're supposed to learn with whoever you're with, and you're supposed to walk away with some new knowledge and not meant to read the plaques to see the collections and think about how the collections got there, um, who's writing the plaques, and you know things of that nature. And, in ways to critique this dissemination of knowledge that happens here. And so that's why we're talking about museums today and particularly, particularly within the realm of representation. And so um, on the right here, there's this shirt that says museums are not neutral. Um, it's a movement that started, I believe in 2016 with this phrase of museums are not neutral using hashtags and placing them on shirts and mugs. And it's a movement started by museum professionals, which was a pretty cool thing to be having this conversation, not only from museum professionals to the public, but also between the museum workers and have this conversation about the power that museums have and the fact that museums have presented themselves and been presented in society as being objective, as being this, 
this place where you learn these facts that are just facts and you're not supposed to question them and they're objective, they're just science and learning. And so this, this phrase really brings into conversation the reality that museums have an agenda and have had an agenda that is not just about learning. And I think that this, this phrase is really interesting and something to work with because I appreciate the ways in which saying museums are not neutral allows us to think about the ways that we can utilize museums for positive change, especially um, within communities of color who have been hurt by museums. But it also doesn't give way to the weight that museums have carried and the harm that have been done because museums at the most have been conspirators and at the least have been complacent in the settler colonial process. And um, part of this conversation is the ability of representing communities and learning and knowledge, as I've said. And so on the left here is a sign from the Port Madison Indian Reservation, which is across the water from Seattle. And it is a, speaks a little bit to my um, experience and journey with museums because I was, uh, I started with museums <laughs> by babysitting in Paul's Bow and I would take the Bainbridge Ferry from Seattle to Bainbridge, drive through the Port Madison Indian Reservation and end up in Paul's Bow. And for a while this sign wasn't there and wasn't present and I found out later it was due to vandalism. This is the new sign, a picture of it. And this really started my process of thinking about the ways in which representation take and hold space and affect how people maneuver within space. And so, as mentioned in my bio, I worked with the Suquamish Museum for my honors history thesis, writing a history of this museum and the ways in which museums, again, having the social power by what they are, how they're utilized by communities to change narratives and to make positive changes for Native communities and for other people of color. And so what does it mean to utilize this colonial institution that again has done harm, but also is, has such a power that what does it mean when we start taking that power back and using that power and utilize it in a way that again changes the space through this representation and i think um i think one thing when raquel first showed me this picture of museums are not neutral and the shirt that was going around i think i was super confused in the way that i mean there's so many ways that a museum isn't neutral i think it can be nuanced down to the collections and representation but also who's privileged to see that museum and i think this like onset say of museums are not neutral of course they're not neutral i think you know i don't always see my people's you know being represented to the fullest in any museum so of course they're not neutral and just saying this with a 20 dollars fee on it is also just cool like i could have done that too um so yeah well and also that speaks to the ways that museum have gotten to this place in that museums were vital to the settler colonial process, the process that's still ongoing now. Um, Ojibwe historian Jean O'Brien has a book titled Firsting and Lasting and writes about how the settler colonial society to justify this colonization utilized this idea of being first. But to be the first, there had to be a certain amount of removing, romanticizing, and demoting Native peoples in order to, again, justify this colonization, this taking up space. And that happened by taking Native um, indigenous um, materials and cultural materials and placing them in museums, romanticizing this past, but then also claiming that this Western civilization that was dominating in a really violent way was doing what it was supposed to because now it's it's the first to utilize this land accordingly um and part of that too is there's a quote from historian douglas cole in his book captured heritage the scramble for northwest coast artifacts and it says the invention of the primitive other by westerners and their museums served not merely to construct stereotypes of indian culture but at least as much 
to construct Western identity opposite to all that was native and primitive. And that quote showcases how museums were a part of this, of this process, because if you're gonna remove native culture, but simultaneously romanticize and say like, oh, this was in the past, this technology was in the past and we're here now, placing it in a, in a institution that then is supposed to teach everyone about how it's in the past is fundamental to that removing process. And so museums haven't been neutral and they're not neutral now. And what does it mean as we critically think about this and start engaging with museums and holding them accountable in not just now, but in our future? Yeah, and what do, you know, what does the environment have to do with museums? Where does that come in? And, and that's the next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this is from the Burke Museum. It's the water lines map. So this is a map of Seattle, but turned horizontal instead of vertical. A lot of maps have um, the north-south orientation. And so this is a east-west orientation of Seattle. And it's meant to um, kind of confuse the person who's looking at it for a second because you're you know it's Seattle but you're not recognizing how it's supposed to be Seattle and that's a part of showcasing that the way that we teach and we learn about things is through a lens it's it's not objective it's with an agenda and so this is meant to kind of reshape and and have the the onlooker be a little more critical of mapping which has also been a, an incredibly colonial process um, to facilitate this this state and environment the environment has everything to do with museums not only because there are I mean again the Burke Museum is a museum of natural history and so um, at the Burke we talk about the environment all the time in, in our various different departments and with different exhibits but also the way that people who are not um, n not going to like I should say, not specified in certain fields, um, learning about other topics like the environment happens in museums. Again, you can go to a museum as an adult and it's a great learning experience and you're expected to learn it there. And so learning about things that you don't know about happens in museums and that happens with the environment and learning about climate change and how the earth moves and dinosaurs. Um, and so that, definitely that representation of the environment is already in museums and so it's it's more now a conversation of shifting it to what should be saying to what what museums should be saying to provide justice and and can not provide justice but work towards justice alongside the communities that they're accountable to and provide justice for those indigenous communities through museums we can see a lot of change and we can see a lot of that placing back of indigenous knowledge systems to environmental justice. Um, we can show how one cultural treasure is important to solving a crisis and connecting those treasures back to the communities. And that's what you can do with the museums. Um, so we specifically asked two friends of ours, um, just a simple question. We asked them, what, um, how do you present indigenous knowledge in the environment. And I got about an email this long, oh, and what am I supposed to do? I, I don't know this question, what should I go upon? Um, and I was like, no, just answer the question. Just think about it, not too long. Um, send us a clip, three minutes long, of just how do you present indigenous knowledge? Because we wanna hear it from the community members as well, who aren't typically in museums, um, but you know, have that indigenous knowledge to share. Um, so it's meaningful to a lot of our friends, but just hearing those in words and just that simple question um, really brings a lot of that um, indigenizing to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd also say showcasing how museums can make, be making change to start having this conversation of environmental justice and what that actually looks like in relation to um, the indigenous communities and alongside indigenous communities who have been fighting for this, who have been fighting for the climate and protecting waters and these movements and what it means to have 
the social power that museums have already back that and participate with it in a really non-political way, or I should say in a political way. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think a big thing we wanted to, you know, note is that what I try to tell people is that it's indigenizing, it's not decolonizing. And that's, you know, a step that we really have to make is that we're as indigenous, you know, person myself, I'm asserting myself into the museum and it's not a decolonized space because it's still that institution, but it's more indigenous. Um, this left photo from Nam Geese First Nations um, is up in Alert Bay. Um, and this is right where you get off the BC ferries. And this, um, these posts with the double-headed serpent, uh, a work of art in itself, has the sign, protect wild salmon, stop open net fish farming. And this kind of took my eye because this was the first thing you see when you enter their community. And it's the first thing that, you know, tourists or people going to the potlatches see. Um, it says Gala Kessla, and which is welcome and thank you. And every, you know, that all relations in that. And I think it was profounding to me because it was a way that they were asserting themselves through their art, through their language, and asserting their environmental concerns right off the bat. And it got me thinking of how museums can do this and what museums are doing to combat, um, you know, environmental harms or promote environmental justice. And how are they really listening to their caretakers? As we talked in the beginning, um, we're stretching upon a lot of land here, um, but it's all connected. Um, this right photo was taken by my brother when I toured, around, toured him around the Burke. Um, and it's just kind of, I like it um, because this was something that I held one of my father's um, carved bowls with the Salish figures um, around it. And he never told me about it, of course. I mean, classic, um, didn't tell me about anything like that. And I was just like, wow, this is super cool. And my brother caught that, you know, picture with the Chief Wahoo hat above, you know, kind of oxymoronic on the, you know, baseball cap. And just that's indigenizing. That's having me in that space and inviting Indigenous students into that space. And that's what we did with the, you know, Indigenous research. And it wasn't decolonizing. The Burke wasn't decolonized. It was indigenized in that little space. Um, so that's kind of what we go off of. And what well, I'd also say too that a big um, article that has been um, sent around a lot, which is really great, is decolonization is not a metaphor with Eve Tuck and um, Dr. Yang. Yang, thank you. And um, a big part of their article is that decolonizing has, the word has started to be used in a way that is not true to the meaning in that decolonizing is about power and land and returning those things because that is what colonization is. It's taking and facilitating power and taking land and all the, all the things that encompass with those two because it's, so, it's such a large and harmful and violent process. And so a big part of what representation is is taking up space and that has to do with power but to use decolonizing in this really blanketed way that i've seen museums start to do and other institutions start to do isn't true to the real process and the work that needs to be done and can be misleading and so it's a process of recognizing what these shifts need to be in indigenizing and starting to starting to have museums engage with indigenous knowledge systems and value indigenous knowledge systems because they are valuable and wonderful and these knowledge systems just being not not western doesn't doesn't mean that they're not good and western knowledge systems had have created this process of qualifying themselves and the system of qualification and proving worthiness, but it's only to reinforce its own power. And so having museums and spaces start to really critically engage with what, what knowledge is 
is supposed to be right and better is super important to this conversation. Yeah, and I think we just kind of just want to have a slide for this is that environmental justice is indigenous representation. And don't take that at face value of just indigenous representation that you have a token native with you, but also that you have a board that you listen to about the environmental harms and how the tribes interacting. Um, I think, you know, one thing we talk about is that Montlake cut um, when it was opened up in, you know, early 1900s, um, 1918, like 16, around there. Um, there's a place name that goes with that, and it's Carry the Canoe. And people often forget about that, and that it's just the Montlake cut. And when that was opened up to open up Lake Washington to Lake Union, there's stories of native Duwamish people in their canoes lowering down seven feet in their canoes. And just the hurt to the salmon in the ecosystem. And we talk about Union Bay Natural Area. I mean, that was underwater. Um, and that's not natural. And having indigenous representation tells you about those stories. It tells you about place names. Um, and that's what environmental justice is. There was a recent um, story actually like last night or this morning, uh, I was telling, I was like, we have to get this on the presentation. Let's move the <laughs> slides out. This has to go on. Um, and it was about the Ninipu, um, Nez Perce people and their fight for the Snake River um, and undamming the Snake River and the environmental justice and salmon protection that had gone with that. And the Seattle Times had interviewed the Nimipu and their chief and was just talking about how big the Snake River is and how big the Columbia is. Um, as I said, I'm a person of the Columbia River. I'm a Chinook person, um, right all the way down here. Um, and when I saw this, you just see the place names that are on this. And once you associate a relationship to a place, you understand the histories um, the trauma and the life that those places give. And I think museums need to uplift those voices in that way that transcends into environmental justice. As we said in the beginning, everyone goes to a museum knowing, learning something, you know? And if you give them something like this that they can directly relate to that, Spokane, falls up high. You know, they associate with them that stuff, that Indians are not frozen in time, that they're not people of the past, but that was a fishing water, river and water feature. Um, and when they see these dams, talk about them in the museum um, and talk about the effects to indigenous people. And you got to get over that hurdle of being nice about it. Just, you know, rip off that band-aid and be like, this is how indigenous people are hurting to educate others. Um, but you can't do that without the indigenous representation because they'll tell you how to do that. Um, and I think it really just goes in the way of having that, you know, place names and that environmental justice to all the animals on here on this map. Um, and it shows the trade and resources. Um, what, what, do you, what do you think when you look at this map? When I also, yeah, what I think a lot about when I see this map is the, the amount of knowing these places, looking at these, these place names indicate a knowing of a place, place where deer have fawns, like that, that shows and, and indicates a, an amount of knowing and longevity with a place and knowing a place for a long time creates intimate relationships with this space and and an understanding of how that space the environment works and that's a part of this conversation as well in that indigenous people have been here since time immemorial and know these places and know this system these environmental systems and are in relationship with them and can speak to how to undo some of the environmental harms that are occurring and that have been occurring through Western technologies that seemed wonderful. Damming the river 
to Western society was supposed to be great. And even now, listen, um, you can still hear arguments that hydro energy is really sustainable when in reality, dams can very drastically shift, change, and alter riverways and water. And all of the peoples and the animals that utilize and share and work with that water. And so that's, that's also a part of this representation and being in museums is this knowledge being there and understanding that there are, there were a time, there is a time before a lot of these environmental harms and the knowledge that was gathered and learned there is valuable to addressing those harms. Yeah. And just so much knowledge is situated in this place. Um, and so much needs to not be exploited, but shared with, you know, have the indigenous people share that and have them share the ideas about environmental justice. Um, so kind of when we were first, you know, asked to do this presentation, you know, it was thinking about ways, what museums are and what environmental justice is. And, you know, fishing and gathering and, you know, carving a canoe is all environmental justice because that's an act of resistance for indigenous people. It's, we were told we weren't supposed to do that. And museums sometimes reinforce that image that we're not supposed to be there anymore. Um, they put us behind glass and it's kind of that act of resistance that has to go with environmental justice. Um, and this is kind of goes into Cedar Lifeways. Um, this is a um, kind of slide that I wanted to show and just connect how everything can be connected to Cedar. And that can go through the museum and that can go through environmental justice. We talk a lot about Celilo Falls and the Dalles um, and the damming over there. Um, and on the left is a, a blown glass piece by my father. Um, and it showcases the salmon and there's a little etching in the back. I don't know if you guys can see that, that um, there wasn't a good picture taken uh, from the Masonian, a museum that has this right now, but it was an etching of old Celilo Falls. Um, and for those who don't know about Celilo Falls, that was a historical place for the people of those, that area, that it was a fishing ground that people in Washington, ancestors could all, you know, kind of go back to that place. And someone been there themselves. It was such a great gathering place. Um, and once it was dammed, it was flooded. So it wasn't that place anymore and totally destructed those life ways. And going back to Cedar is that it kind of, teaches us about these force and these old knowledge systems. Um, and then on the right is a picture that my sister drew um, a little bit ago. And that top, that top, you know, like second, second to the top, um, there's a woman fishing. And um, that is someone who would have been at Celilo Falls. And this is a picture of her ancestors. Um, and it all starts with the cedar tree. Um, we were taught, you know, funerals happen in cedar trees, that our transportation comes from cedar trees, canoes. Um, and seeing that representation is amazing in museums and seeing it in environmental justice makes me think that I belong in that field as well. That makes me think I can do a difference because someone wants to listen to me. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we asked the question about as well, is how do you present indigenous knowledge in relation to the environment? And we also got like, oh, I'm not a scientist. Like, I can't do that. And I was like, don't say that. Like, you have indigenous knowledge systems. And, you know, traditional ecological knowledge. Um, I kind of like that term, but I also, it's, it seems too traditional that people use. Oh, that's back in the, you know, back in those times, they had traditional ecological knowledge. And I was like, I still use that now. Like, we can change this stuff with, you know, environmental justice with this traditional knowledge. These indigenous people have been using this the whole time. And it's showcased through museums sometimes. 
And that was kind of a way to, you know, talk about that. It's just indigenous representation is environmental justice. Um, yeah, I mean. Yeah. I really love um, Shivana's point that indigenous people don't need anyone's permission to be doing environmental work or the work of revitalizing culture. And I think that that's really important to emphasize in this type of conversation in that museums should also not be co-opting this and start, um, you know, trying to run what this conversation of indigenous representation in these spaces, in, in this, this space of um, knowledge and representation that the that museums hold and should instead be listening and working alongside indigenous people of what that representation and that that environmental work that needs to be done and how that should be presented to the visitors of museums and I thought that that was a really great point and I'm glad that we ended with her video. <laughs> Yeah, so we're just gonna open it up to questions. Um, we got some already in the chat, um, but we'll really answer anything about environmental justice, indigenous representation. If you have any contacts, um, just let us know. Um, so we'll we'll go through we'll go through some stuff. Um, I knew there was one question about can you um, decolonize a museum? Um, and I think the question in that is just reinforcing indigenizing, not decolonizing. You're not going to be able to decolonize a colonial institution. Um, yeah. There's well, I think that it's also a really complex structure in that, um, collections that are in the Burke and the conversations of returning those are really important and also just the rec the recognition that it's still the the consolidation of power that museums hold is so embedded into the museum itself this consolidated this perspective that they whoever is running the museum is the right person and projection of these knowledges and the communication of different types of fields and information. And I think that museums can be changed and transformed and it should be something that we're thinking about to engage with and think critically about how museums can, can start to transform. Um, and I think a little bit too about what we were saying is more so this co-opting of the word of decolonizing and this um, use of the word to say that having a Native American advisory board is decolonizing is a bit misleading in that a lot of time, like does the board have voting power? Does, is the board making decisions? And these are things to be engaging with when, and think critically of this conversation of what this colonial institution does and the power it still remains to hold. Yeah, I think excellent, excellently put. Um, someone else asked, um, what else is happening with other museums for the strive for indigenizing um, zoos and aquariums? What should we do? What social pressure? Um, I actually have the privilege to serve on the Seattle Aquarium's waterfront um, new project as a tribal consultant. And I work with some fellow other indigenous people um, with Suquamish and Muckleshoot. Um, and we kind of just talk about what is it, what do we want to see with indigenous people in this aquarium? And I was like, I did not go to, um, and just about the realities for indigenous people out of the aquarium. It's expensive. Uh, and just what would you like to see? And the biggest thing that I told them is I want to see language. I want to see language at the museum. Uh, and another question that I think is fun is like, what would our ideal museum look like? And like building one from ground up. And I've been talking to Raquel about this a little bit, but I was saying, I want to see a museum in Seattle. It's going to happen one day 
that it's just a Coast Salish museum of art, modern art and treasures. And each curator is from the different tribes that make up these Coast Salish regions. And it's just that. It's a big museum just to the original caretakers, um, just as we said in our land acknowledgement, um, that they're gonna still be doing this until after the university is here. Um, so let's start listening to them. Um, yeah. Um, another question was, are there any efforts being made at the Burke to indigenize it and how can students get involved in this to help? Um, and I think talking a little bit more about the indigenous research family. Yeah, getting. so um, ways to indigenize that. Um, I work with curator um, Sven Hawkinson um, in collaboration with Holly Barker, who does the Pacific Islander research family. And I wanted to bring native students into the Burke. Um, so I, I was fortunate enough to have um, some students um, and we came into the Burke every single week. It was a class and we went through the collections and just hung out and we talked about stuff in our own space. There was no one, it was just a native space for us to talk um, and talk about our ancestors treasures and how they were used and kind of closely dissect um, where they all came from. And we talked a lot about the environment because a lot of things there are so connected to the environment. Bentwood boxes, feasting bowls, um, all cedar. Um, and ways that you, you can get involved is reach out to the Burke. Um, it's free for UW students um, once we're back in person. Um, and just talk to those people. Um, there's people, <laughs> there's people, out, people in the Burke that are in this conversation right now. And there's students that want to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that, you know, they just say, well, just contact us. And it's just taking those steps um, and just being open because they want to work with you. Um, so just reach out. Um, they'd love to have you. And um, in addition to that as well, the Northwest Native Art Gallery is a part of the Contemporary Culture um, Department or an exhibit from the Contemporary Culture Department. And they collaborated with six um, women Native artists from all along the Northwest Coast and had those artists choose pieces in the collection that told a story and were with a theme and also contributed their own pieces to this to different conversations about heritage and what that looked like and that exhibit for me is really moving and powerful and and is taking up this space in this narrative and having conversations about materials and values and lessons learned and clothing and art and it's a really wonderful um, exhibit for when it's open again and i would also say that it kind of touches with another question that was how does the process of incorporating indigenous storytelling into museum scripts look like and that um exhibit actually has um so not only the plaques from artists and words directly from artists but also um there is voice recordings of the artists talking about this and talking about the significance of the pieces that they they picked and contributed to the gallery and the conversation that they wanted to be having and the stories related there and so something that i thought was really great about that is it engaged sound too in this museum um and in it in in storytelling and like telling of of what this all means um in their own words and that was super important for this space that space yeah another question is there a way that museums can present present material culture without asserting ownership that's a great question um This can look at our tribal cultural centers, not museums, cultural centers. That's what they call them. Um, and there's one up in Tulalip Hibble um, and, you know, Suquamish. And they just really talk about how it's their stuff and that they're the ones that can tell that story. Um, so when you look at other, you know, exhibits without that, you know, ownership, look be critical about is there indigenous language is it a specific person is it not just 
uh, conglomerate? Is it Coast Salish? Like, what is it not? Is it Coast Salish? Like, in the terms of that's kind of an overall umbrella term. Is there a specific tribe, and who owns it? Ask yourself that. Um, and are communities getting to engage with it in the yeah. museum? Um, are the community words and opinions and stories being told in that space as well? Yeah. In a way that from the community, the community decides to say those things um, is what I meant by that. But. And I think that's, I think the Burke does a great um, job at that in activating space and seeing those community members there and hosting um, those kind of events. Um, when it opened, it was like the largest, you know, opening for a museum. Um, and they did Indigenous Peoples Day there. And just seeing those community members there and happy to be a part of it. Um, and just really highlighting those community members. Um, yeah. Right. Any more questions? Okay. I think. What are, what are your thoughts on how to represent the ideas around land, waters, treaties, and reparations? It's a great question. Um, again, this, this, this kind of touches upon um, art, you know, contemporary art, seeing it in a modern use that indigenous people are here. Um, and seeing the treaties, I always like to say that these treaties are not just indigenous people's treaties, they're everybody's treaties. Um, that everyone has a relationship if you're working and living and if you're a property owner on this land, then you're a part of this treaty too. In Seattle, it's the Treaty of Point Elliot. Um, learn that. Learn that you're a part of this treaty and be critical about museums and see if they're including that kind of treaty element into it as well. Um, Hibble, as I talked before, actually had the Treaty of Point Elliot on display for a while. Um, so it was amazing to see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd also say in relation to the treaty, treaty conversations when presented by Western institutions are often projected as the treaty that benefits native people. When in reality, treaties are a two way street and Western societies gain so much by getting to be in spaces and native communities and tribes reserved their rights in treaties and the fact that treaties are being dismissed and broken by the U.S. state should have settler society being being mad, or at least in I can. I'm a non-native person. I'm a settler, and it makes me frustrated that the treaty is being broken and that it's it's projected as being a native problem. That this treaties being broken is something that native people have to work to fix when in reality the other the people on the other side of the treaty should also be really frustrated that this treaty is broken and treaties are the supreme law of the land and the way that the u.s treats treaties with native communities you might not know that and also don't get talked about much but um <laughs> the way that they just get broken and dismissed is not representative of that fact and so um that's definitely a really important thing to be to be mindful of and to have in places of representation um and i think maybe a last one can you speak to how indigenous languages can be uplifted in museums and help work towards environmental justice the culture is living um exhibit in the burke museum has different um coast salish and languages of washington in general uh being played a uh, community member saying different words in their languages and then there's also a very large language map and i think that that is a really important and wonderful piece to the exhibit and the, the different ways that communities are engaging with these things and that the western view of them through western language doesn't isn't the only thing. And I think that that language map is really wonderful as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing, nothing more. There's a lot of questions here that we can't um, answer tonight just because there's so many. Um, and the retention of everybody's saying is great. And thank you all. Um,
I think I just want to close it out just being um, just be critical about where you see indigenous people being inputted and asked questions upon and consulted about. Um, when you're working in the environment, Shavana said it the best, that um, we're always connected to the land um, and that we're always one people and that we have all our traditions that come from the land. We're environmental people. So also it's kind of, you know, indigenous people are environmental justice listening to us. And, you know, hearing that otherwise is also just the colonial narrative that we haven't gotten the justice that we need and to showcase that in language, culture, um, ceremonial practice, because that has been taken away from us. Um, yeah, you have any last thing? Yeah. Well, thank you all. Um, you guys have a wonderful night. Um, and you guys know where to find us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think Constance is. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you both so much. Um, I know we can't hear applause over webinars, but lots of folks in the chat and the Q&A participating tonight. We so appreciate you all for being here. Um, and just want to invite folks to join us in March for our third installment of our salon series. So have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>